X. But that might be the wrong thing to do. But uh, we'll see how we get on. He's a funny man, so she'll be all right. Right, I better say. Um, as promised, we're talking to Eddie Lizard on the show this morning. Eddie, lovely meeting you. Very nice to meet you. The O2 on May the 26th. Yes, indeed. Look forward to that. Um, this isn't disconcerting, uh, being interviewed by a man in a wheelchair who isn't really in a wheelchair. Uh, that's, that's the intriguing part, being interviewed by someone in a wheelchair, not at all. Um, um, the, the fact that you're, what you're going through I find quite intriguing. Um, mm. And I suddenly started thinking, I wonder how I would cope if I was in a wheelchair for 24 hours um, or life. So, uh, but yes, uh, I'm, uh, hopefully you're, you, you seem to be learning something that you can impart to other people and you can... How difficult, number yeah. one. Uh, upper body strength, don't yeah. have enough of it. People are looking down on you, that's the big thing. I find you go into a room, you're at uh, waist yes. level. It's all very different. It's the difference in the power thing yeah. that goes on. But it uh, might be something you could do at some point, isn't it? Uh, in what way? What, uh, do the 24 yeah. hours kind of thing? Well, I mean, if, if somebody... Well, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to do it right this second, but, but I am, no, I'm very positive about um, trying to highlight things in, in different ways. I mean, as a transvestite, I go around, as you, you can't see on radio, but my, I have these painted nails with the European flag and a British flag on, so British, European, transvestite. So that, that... Um, and nothing it has nothing to do with being in a wheelchair, but it is something you know about. Uh, it points out certain things, and certain people can read something off that and go, "Ah, yeah, this guy's a transvestite, but he's not actually doing stuff." I mean, I'm doing comedy, or I'm doing marathon running, I'm doing other things, which means that it's it, your life isn't all about the nails, mm. even though they're there and they occasionally flash and even up. Though you wore them to Africa for the beginning of that, yes, indeed, the I did. It's journey. So I just watched, this is wonderful. Um, as I watched that bit, and as you were explaining your life to people, where stand-up came into it went through my mind a lot. Is it still very important to you, or, or where stand-up stand comedy? Yeah. Um, I think it, it. Yeah, yes, it is. I'm going to be touring for the rest of my life, even though I'm going to. I'm, I'm uh, heading towards trying to be mayor of London and going for the nomination in 2019, which would mean 2020. I'd go into politics, and I have to put my career into hibernation, but. It's, it's something you can set up yourself. You can say, hey, I w want to do the, what I'm claiming is now the most extensive comedy tour the world has ever seen, because um, I'm playing Kathmandu and Moscow and Berlin and, and touring in French and in, in Paris and throughout France. Um, so I, I can just choose that. I don't have to get together, we were talking about Blur just recently, I don't have to get together with the rest of the band and say, is it all right if we go and do it now? I just say, I'm going to do it. So that's one of the thing about being a solo performer. And a stand-up, you don't even need that much equipment. Um, you know, you just talk. But how in terms of keeping um, whatever it was drove you in the first place? Because your life has changed out of recognition, surely. Yes, it has, but it sort of got more into the recognition of what I wanted it to be in, <laughs> rather than the place where it was where nothing was happening. I mean, I did, at seven, I wanted to act. And now I am doing decent acting roles, getting off of decent acting roles and doing them, and hopefully mastering them. And... Uh, also doing stand-up, which I love Monty Python, I love the goons, and now I'm going around holding a flag for them, because I do say that you know, I'm basically doing Monty Python and stand-up. And so flying a flag for them, hopefully, uh, anytime anyone asks me about it, and pushing it out for myself, and encouraging other people, you know, saying mm. Irish kids, British kids, French kids, go out and do your stand-up. I'm encouraging French people to do it in English right at the moment. I've already, there's always really Michael Mittermeier, one of the biggest German stand-ups. I'm a co-promoter of his, and he's doing it in English in London and did the Edinburgh Festival. The Melting Pot, I think, is a great way forward for us. I'm against the right wing. Um, my, my life is now in an interesting place. Right. In a positive place, and uh, hopefully other people are going. Hey, yeah, I'd like to do some of that stuff. I don't know if they'd be able to. Um, you, you say that very easily. He, the German man can do his gig in English. You do your gig in French. Is there, are you not unique in that being able to? Do well, that? as you can see, this is the German guy's already doing it in English. So there's at least oh, two of us. So. Right. so it's no. I mean, I do think of things which are not in your normal thought patterns maybe mm, yeah. and, I, and then I go for them I say okay 43 marathons or run around the United Kingdom however mar I didn't know how many marathons it would be I'm going to go for that doing gigs in French I suddenly had this inspiration I thought if I do gigs in French that'll be that'll be a signpost it's, it's, it's positive for business mm. I mean I'm going into be mayor of London I want to encourage people to set up businesses I, do, am I, do I know anything about business I do I carve my way I am at the moment carving my way into France to get mm. my product, which is myself and my comedy, on sale there. And no one in France that thought it could happen. 
I was there with the French promoter saying, we, you know, we won't put any money into this. And I'm putting my own money into it. And then I'm going to do it in Germany. And then I'm going to do it in Spain. So it's all positive. And, but I do believe other people can do it. But sometimes some people need to see someone else do it once. And go, mm. oh, that guy's doing it. I'll have a go at that one. So that's my idea. And you are, it's twice you, you've mentioned it now. The first time I, was, I wasn't sure if I heard you correctly, but you really are going to try to be the, the mayor of London. Yeah, yeah. Nomination for the Labour Party in 2019. Why? Because I don't like the right wing. The right wing keeps coming up, especially in financial crises, and they come up and they say, separate out, let's pull off, let's hate the immigrants. Um, I'm for people. You saw me do the documentary on BBC. We come from 10,000 people. We're now 7 billion. Mm. We are all the same. There are differences, but we are all the same. We're completely different. We're all exactly the same. We have to get to a place where the entire world is a fair place. I'm here in Dublin, in, in Ireland, and the Irish people for years have struggled against oppression from the English. Now we're in a better place. Now we have boy bands that come over from Ireland into Britain. At the moment we have an, an English band that, the, the, with One Direction playing One at Direction, the point, yeah. but that's going the other way around. Yeah. But it's great if, if boy bands are swapping over, then something has changed. If Graham Norton is one of the highest paid people in Britain, and he's a Protestant Irishman. If you think back to yeah. what happened in the post office in, in 1916, I hope they would be happy with where we are now, because we're in a way better position. It's a different, I don't think they planned that in any You'd shape. You'd love to know what they would think. You would love to know <laughs> what they would think. But I do feel it is in a way better position, because you know, 60 years ago, they said no, no blacks, no mm. Irish, no dogs, and horrible mm. signs like that in Britain, which does not happen anymore. Uh, and even though there can be negative things going on, everything and the racists are still there. I'm fighting against the racists. Right. Um, I was very taken by Meet the Azuts. Not many people can get to trace their own DNA. Yeah. All the way back to the original woman of the world. Well, it was it was more that it's as the, as the history goes back. It is all of our histories going back yeah. there. Initially, you know, the the, the Saxon and Viking. A more recent past is my father's and my mother's history, but as it goes further back, it is all of us, it is yours mm -hmm. and anyone who was watching, um, except for African peoples, because they were the original people of slightly. They stayed where they were, more or less. Yes, or it gets slightly confusing. African descendants of Africans now, I'm not sure, quite sure how that fits yeah. into the whole. But what was really fascinating was that they traced markers in your DNA, I was picking yeah. this up as I went along, but a marker is a new, distinct. DNA, isn't it? It's well, your DNA exists for a number of generations, and then it twists slightly. It just mm. twists, and it makes a slight marker. They used to call it um, um, mutation, which is a hellish word. Marker is a better word. So it just basically twists. It just does this. So every numbers of generations yeah. out from the main thing, it twists. So the the people in Europe have way more markers than the people back in Africa or other original people. That's why we can trace it all the way back. And you were able to trace that you'd gone out through um, Turkey and up through Scandinavia. It's your mother in particular that you yes. were most fascinated by because she had passed when you were so young. Yeah, well I was fascinated by both because Dad came in with, with Dad's line. We came up the Danube um, before the last glaciation height, which was before, we came in about 30,000 years ago. So we came into Europe early. Whereas Mum's line was going in slower and then mm. going up into the Viking. The Viking, it just sounds great to be a Viking. Because <laughs> I did want to be a Viking, but even though they were horrendous people, but I don't know, something Viking's got something that about That was a lovely twist to it. And now on top of that, that you managed to trace the origin of your blue eyes. <laughs> I thought it was Yes, the blue eyes is, is, is in Turkey, and, um, yeah. and that's interesting. And the fact that through the Neanderthal, I'm 2.8% Neanderthal, everyone outside Africa is, every non African is between 1% and 4% and uh, Neanderthal. And, uh, and they were the white skinned people, and the Homo sapiens were the black skinned people. So that's really interesting. And that's just melanin, yeah. how much melanin there is in your yeah. skin. Due to a chemical thing in your body, we have had wars and death mm -hmm. throughout history, you know, hundreds of thousands of years, and it's just due to a chemical thing. And that's insane. You were trying to trace, though, where this, um, you know, how this, all of this track ended up with you and with your mum. Yeah. Um, and one of the fascinating things that came up was the nature and nurture thing. And we've talked to people on the show who've been adopted and have discovered they were adopted late in life. Right. And have traced their mothers and found this is where vast parts of their personality came from. Did you see stuff like that? Did you see a real nature and nurture distinction? Um, yeah, I still. I, I still think there's a lot of uh, nature in there. It's like um, mum so mum was a singer and did more of the performance stuff and dad had the sense of humour so I can see bits coming from different sides. Dad's side through his mother, my grandmother, uh, was very determined. 
dad's dad was not uh, it was a very relaxed mm. guy and like watching he loved watching he loved gadgets and he had a motorbike until he was in his 60s so I see that coming through Grand Island. I love all the gadgets um, and he loves Stingray and Captain Scarlet and stuff like this he's my granddad now mm. I, I, did, I, I was always wondering why my granddad was into that stuff but I'm sure when I'm in my granddad's age if Stingray comes on I think this is great so he just loved those stories and, and we used to come around for Sunday lunch and go, oh come over here and have a look and um, so it's interesting looking my, my, my mother's father called Grandfather with a Pipe we called him Grandfather with a Pipe and he, because you do when you're kids, you don't think about this, he had a pipe. And I never knew my, his, his wife, she had already died. But he claimed he was, on my m mother's birth certificate, he was a shepherd. And he wasn't. He was a cowman. He moved cows in and out of barns. So if you imagine this guy with a pipe, who was reading the works of Dickens, constantly rereading the works of Dickens, became the local Lothario in Appledore, in a town in Kent because his wife had died, and he was going around all the divorcees going, hey, and saying, shall I read you some bits of, uh, of, of, um, of uh, what's his face? Um, what's, what was the writer I was just saying? Dickens? Uh, Dickens, Dickens, I was going for chapter. Um, so he was doing all that, and he was claiming he was a shepherd, because I think he thought it sounded good, which I think is, <laughs> is interesting. And it's he's wonderful. Put, put that into my career, it just so it makes sense. At the end of it, it appears you are unique. Yeah, is it, if I was reading the, the scientists correctly, there's a marker in you that doesn't seem to exist in anybody else. Your DNA is, is almost mutated within you. Well, I think there's a, there's a some marker there that's different. I don't think, no, I really don't think I'm, you know, he said there was something, and I can't even remember what he said that was. He said you're good, <laughs> good at fly fishing or something. But um, I, you know, we're all, we all have, we're give, given a certain amount of genetic cards when we're born. Yeah. And I think the trick is to look at them and try and play them as best you can. That is the thing of it, and there's a certain amount of luck in that, there's a certain amount of uh, chance, certain application, determination and application, I think, is the most important thing. And that's the good thing, mm -hmm. the good word for the, every citizen of the world is that application and determination can change your cir circumstances. Hopefully, if you have a good heart, with that, you can get to a good place, because there have been mm -hmm. some very negative, determined people. But Nelson Mandela is my greatest hero ever because what he did with his determination was fantastic. An incredible story. You've mentioned you, the marathons that you didn't think you pulled it off. Are you honestly going to do them again? Yes, I attempted to do 27 marathons in 27 days for him. That's a documentary that's coming out on Sky in a, a month or so. And I did four and I was on a certain uh, prescription drug and you weren't allowed to be running on that. I didn't realize this and so it, um, it, it, it shreds your insides. So they said, stop, stop right now. Retrain, go back, and get, do it again. So I went, okay. So that's looking what forward I, to that. Yeah, I, I do. I really, no, I really want to finish. I was very looking forward to giving this small tribute, yeah. twenty-seven marathons, twenty-seven days for Nelson Mandela's twenty-seven years in prison. I like the idea of it. I like the thought of it, and um, I don't like the fact that it's sitting there as something, a job not done. Mm. So, um, but now I'm with good doctors, good trainers, and I, I will go back and get it right the second. The very best of luck with it. Eddie, it's been a pleasure talking to you today. Thank Thanks you very, very much for joining us. Cheers.